Today we welcome Sherry Burton to the podcast to talk about something very close to my heart and that is about suicide survival and how you go about this. If you have somebody that you know or a loved one that has taken this ultimate step and you are the one that stays behind. Sherry Burton is a mother of six and is passionate about feminine leadership and spiritual entrepreneurship. She has been a life coach for over 20 years, holds a psychology degree and has worked in clinical settings as a mental health counselor. Her work draws from the varied and expansive fields of mind-body science, holistic emotional healing, philosophy, spirituality and deep psychology. She runs an international wellness-based biz and loves traveling the world teaching about Mother Earth's tools for transformation. Sherry's podcast, The Soul Rose Show, her online program and retreats guide women to connect to their authentic essence and experience deep transformation and inner awakening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. So welcome to the Sensitivity Doctor podcast, Sherry. We're so happy to have you here and especially to talk about this topic Um Dr. Kelly actually recently uh, released a book on suicidal ideation, and she's very pro speaking about it more and um, also that we shouldn't hide from it. And I'm sure that she can also elaborate a little bit from a therapist's perspective. But I know it's a really difficult topic to broach, and I've uh, unfortunately dealt with this in my own immediate family. So I really know what it feels like and I think that's why I have such a connection to this topic and talking to you about it um, kind of just delving into it I would like to ask you what led to the writing of this book because um, it must have been such a difficult decision to make to actually put this on paper and be so connected to your thoughts surrounding this for such a amount of time you know the effort that goes into the writing process so what made you think okay I, I want to put this down in a book and this is the way I want to go with my story sometimes I have to put some levity around the topic because it's so woo, you know mm -hmm. and I, I've been talking very openly about this for almost 20 years now um so I actually am in the process of a deep memoir. It's not completed yet, but I did self-publish a book on depression um, in 2007, mm -hmm. a couple of years after I lost my sister mm, to mental illness. Beautifully moments. written. <laughs> Thank you. And it, it has been, um, it's one of those things where you know that the choice is, is bigger than you. Like when you ask about what made you sit down and write? Well, I love, I've always loved to write. I've always been a journal writer. And after we lost my sister, who was the mother of five, mm. and uh, her children were two, four, six, eight, and 12 when she oh, passed. So young. And um, I was two years old. I'm two years older than her. And so we've always been very close. We lived in the close, we lived in the same town. Our kids are the same ages. Uh, and losing her, especially, you know, when someone chooses to take their life, it's very, it's a particular kind of pain. It's a particular kind of grief. And, and for me, the catharsis was writing. Hmm. And so originally it was just a lot of journal writing, but then it mm -hmm. became, oh, all these women coming out of the woodwork, mothers who seemingly had it all together, who were, who who because of my sister's choice and because of my being mired in grief felt like I was a safe person for them to, to vent with or talk to about their own vulnerabilities with mental illness. And so just my personality, I love to speak. I love to write. So I just, I thought I've got to get a message out there. I've, in fact, I even stood over my sister's grave at one point just a couple of weeks after we buried her and said, I'll be your voice because that's my mm. way of, mm. <clears throat> excuse me, my way of meeting her legacy, meeting the problems, the shadows. And of course that was 19 years ago and I've had a lot of space around it. So that's why I'm now coming back in to dive a little deeper into, you know, the complexities of, of the illness itself, which she had bipolar and, and depression and also schizophrenia, which we didn't know mm. about till her therapist told us after, you know, she had been buried that 
she had recently been diagnosed schizophrenic. So, so yeah, it was just this inner call, I guess, to, Mm -hmm. to kind of climb in and, and then it became, you know, I do have a background in psychology. I have a psychology degree and I kind of turned it into more like holistic and life coaching. And so it just made me kind of duck my head and try to crack the code on things that people were not talking about back then. And they still, you know, you all know the stigma is still, it's, it's real. It's better. It's more open, you know, people are, but there's still that little, hmm, absolutely. What are you, you know, there's wrongness around it. Mm -hmm. And I want to, even in my own family, we don't talk about it really. It's like Mm. that, that kind of thing that happened, but we don't really go down that route of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I do, I do think that is one of the biggest myths around suicide, that if you talk about it, it's going to instigate the ideas or it's going to inspire someone or make it more likely when in fact research shows the exact opposite, that the more it's discussed, the more it's normalized, the more likely someone is going to get the help they need. Mm-hmm. And to your point about normalizing this, it kind of reminds me of the conversation around miscarriage, how really just in the last, I'd say decade, people are all coming out of the woodwork. You too? Yeah, me too. Oh, we weren't talking about this. Um, I want to say one of the studies that I saw said up to 16% of humans will experience suicidal thoughts during their lifetime. That's millions and millions and millions, millions, billions of people, really, if you think about the whole world. So Mm -hmm. why this is not considered part of the human condition is absolutely just unfathomable to me. Yeah. Yeah. I study a lot of depth psychology, like Jungian type of stuff. And Mm -hmm. and so the collective unconscious and, you know, sort of our collective suffering, we all kind Mm -hmm. of draw from that, even Mm. if it's just not our own ordeal or our generational, intergenerational So we're sort of a culminating generation in the sense that there's more awareness, um, that that also kind of opens Pandora's box because now that we see it and it is being more talked about, um, some people sort of dip into that collective a little more Mm. profusely, if, if you know Mm. what I mean. So it's like this. I know you guys talk about sensitivity. You know, I was going to say, if you add the highly sensitive yeah. trait to that, yes. that, that yeah. mimicking. I definitely, I definitely am a highly sensitive person and mm-hmm. I, I have catalyzed a lot of intergenerational trauma just in my own body. Um, but yes, I, I feel like, you know, we're kind of on the cusp right now of it, of it just being completely normalized as everyone, I I would say everyone has had suicidal ideation. That that's my theory. I've always, and I'm sticking to it because I've always had that, that sort of, even if it's just a fleeting, is this worth it or existential stuff? Oh, sure. If you increase it to that, it's probably everyone. (laughs) Yeah. Well, but just getting, you know, the, the, the full range of human emotions, mm-hmm. you know, that we're all here to feel. And so, you know, there is, um, this connection to, to isolative suffering that we just don't have a scope or an understanding of, of still, you know, because of the stigma and also because some people are more private, even if there is everyone mm-hmm. around them is normalizing it and talking about it, they still feel a profound sense of alienation. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it is, it is a deep and rich um, uh, conversation to have when someone will get real with the shadows mm-hmm. and then you can really have like, well, Oh, me too. Or, um, or like read this or, you know, but, but when you are a highly sensitive person, um, and I noticed this about myself because I did make it a mission to go and, and talk about mental health. Like I just like hand me a microphone. I was, I was right there and have been a mental health activist for a while, but then I stepped away from it and just started doing more of my own work because I didn't like what the system was doing. I didn't like, um, the, 
clinical nature of addressing yeah. these issues. Um, and I'm, I don't say that with any disrespect, but it just became sanitized and void of having the real deep vulnerable, like what's actually creating this, mm -hmm. you know, we just were talking about the <clears throat> symptom of this illness. I actually sat on the state suicide prevention council. Um, the, so this is a kind of an aside, but uh, when my sister took her life, I was Mrs. Utah. So um, mm. it kind of garnered some media attention here in Utah. And so the the Utah Attorney General asked me to be on the State Suicide Prevention Council. So this was 2005, and Utah was leading the nation in suicide, mm. especially a young uh, um, in the like 18 to 24 year old male category, wow. and uh, depression very very high among women. And so my disillusionment with, and that by this time I had worked in clinical settings. I, I worked as a, at a group, um, at an addiction recovery center as a group therapist. I worked at a psychiatric hospital. Um, so it was already in sort of those settings when she took her life. But anyway, he, he invited me to sit on this state suicide prevention council and it was like a think tank. Mm. So they had universe, everything from like university professors and school teachers and clinicians and people, sociologists and um, just people of all, like, what is going on here? What? Let's put our heads together. And here I am, I was representing the suicide survivors. Mm. Um, because, you know, I just want to also give voice to like, even though we're normalizing it and talking about it, if there has been a suicide in a family, Sometimes there is this phenomenon called the copycat syndrome, mm. and it can also happen in close friend groups yeah. or in schools, um, which we have seen here in Utah, that when one person makes that choice, it can set off the yes. idea or, mm -hmm. you know, as an option, whereas before it wouldn't have been an option for other people. Mm -hmm. So my disillusionment with... Um, the professional way of going about the problem. When I sat mm -hmm. in these meetings, the, the highbrow, as opposed mm -hmm. to let's look at the root. <laughs> let's, yeah. let's not just like when we're truly talking about prevention, mm -hmm. let's look at what's actually exacerbating this phenomenon. And um, so that, that was in 2006 or seven. And that's when I wrote my, my book after that, because I was like, yeah. We have to tackle this from an organic grassroots right. yeah. um, level, and it's not going to be a top-down approach. I did really want to speak to what you're saying because um, one of the uncomfortable solutions that I really want to see happen as a clinician is for us as clinicians to change the way that we handle someone coming into our office and saying that they're having suicidal thoughts. And the idea that because so many people can live with passive suicidality their entire life, that it's not a um, dichotomous black or white solution. You're suicidal, let's get you in treatment. You're suicidal, let's hire, order your care. It, it can be, like you're saying, this, this partnership. And as you were putting it, I love how you said kind of like a grassroots organic approach. Um, because I see what happens clinically is that sometimes if the client doesn't trust that we're going to stay with them through the thoughts that we fear that they fear we're going to hand them off to a higher level of care, they won't bring their thoughts up. And similarly, this can happen in the military setting too, where there will be soldiers and we know military are most at risk at this mm -hmm. present time. Um, that they will fear bringing it up in the fear of losing their rank or being um, kicked out of the military or being discharged. And while there are benefits for these folks, that fear of not being understood and not having someone sit with you through the process, I think really has been a problem in the clinical world. Um, there are so many clinicians who think differently and think as you're saying, the organic grassroots form of this, mm -hmm. but I hope more of us can do this. So mm -hmm. I love that yeah. you brought that up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to shift gears a little bit and focus on um, the 
survivors and especially um you know h- how well you kind of articulate this and go through this journey in your book and i was wondering if you can speak to us a little bit about the healing process especially the process where or that phase where you're so angry at this person for for doing it for for putting like their families through it putting you their loved ones through it and then you're hit with this immense guilt about having that anger towards the person that is no longer there to kind of defend their decisions and what must have been going through their minds can you little speak about that a little bit and how you deal with those those phases that you go through yeah so i know elizabeth kubler ross has the stages of grief um And I definitely felt like anger was my most delayed emotion. Mm. Um, I was angry enough at her while she was alive is is kind of my story because she, um, in her illness was, could be manipulative and, um, was just a lot of drama. Mm -hmm. And so, My guilt was that I was mad at her while she was alive, Um, that knowing her personality, she's kind of a very larger than life, literally, paradoxically person, and very forgiving. But there, there can be with some loved ones, especially if it's somebody who's suffered for a while, a sense of relief when you kind of get off that roller coaster of the drama. Mm. And um, she also had an addiction. So she had an addiction to um, prescription pain medication because she had, um, she had two rods fused on either side of her spine when she was a teenager. Mm. So she was in chronic pain a lot from scoliosis and she, you know, having five kids. Anyway, there were, there were a lot of dynamics Mm. with her, but I felt sadness, my, my overwhelming, just, it was just the, not just the absence of her, but the ramifications for her children, Mm -hmm. her husband, of course, all of the siblings in our family, my parents, most especially, I would say. And so I was sort of co-regulating my nervous system with everyone around her Mm. who was in the wake of this tragedy, who loved her. It wasn't until probably 10 years in that I allowed myself to fully feel what wanted to be felt. And the body, you know, the body's intelligence, you know, will assess your readiness to address things, especially if you're more of a sustainer where you're making things okay for everyone else, which is totally me. Um, And lots of HSPs. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So... Actually, my sister was also a highly sensitive person. And, you know, I have some theories around like how the environment, how her personality was not conducive with the environment she was in. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, it's, there's no one right way to grieve. Um, And anger is, as for women, as you both know, is the least it's the most stigmatized emotion for a woman to express is anger and we'll just internalize it rather than express it or we'll make it about us rather than, you know, allow ourselves to feel even rage at things that are unjust or our own grief. So I, I feel like when somebody makes such a strong exit from this life and it's almost Mm -hmm. a statement for them, we're each going to interpret it our own ways. We're going to personalize it. We're going to say, what could I have done or whatever, especially if we were close to that person. And I will say, um, I know everybody has differing belief systems around this, but, but I will say that my sister in different ways has come through since then to let me know that there is nothing that, that I could, or anyone else could have done to, Hmm. to prevent that. Um, yeah. So yeah, we do. It's 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 a trigger. There's a book called No Time to Say Goodbye by Carla Fine, and she says um, 
I like her description the most of surviving a suicide of a loved one. She said the world explodes. Mm. Yes. And um, that's the most apt description that I've heard. It's similar to a concentration camp type of trauma for the Mm. people who are surviving that loss. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I felt a lot of anger because I was young when it happened. I was 18. So um, getting ready for my final exams and everything. So there was like a lot going on. And um, this particular family member's son was living with us in our house um, because of the mental situation that had been going on and all of the dynamics there. Um, But it was still a huge shock. We'd never... It was a huge shock to us us all. And there was a message to state that this would be better for everybody involved. And um, I think that's where my anger kind of stemmed from because I saw what this did to the people around me. And I saw how it completely changed the course of events in their lives. Completely. Um, And... I was left wondering, you know, I was left with this kind of anger, but how, how could, how could you possibly have thought that this would be better? Like, how could you not have fought harder or tried more? And um, it's so strange because a couple of years later, I was in a position where I unfortunately had tried to take my own life. And it's only then that my perspective had changed on okay so if I were to then really put myself in this person's Mm -hmm. shoes there's so much going on in your mind and your soul and your body at that moment it's not that you're necessarily thinking of the consequences forward or backward or it's just almost like this detachment of your reality in this moment Um, and that's really one of the things that kind of brought me peace with that situation Um, Although the ramifications of her choice still until today are just so debilitating for for the people that stayed behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think you bring up a good point. It depends on the age you were when it happened as to how what your go to emotion is, because I will say her children um, have had more anger at the abandonment than, Mm -hmm. than us, than Mm -hmm. the adults. Um, and they've, they've worked, they've, a lot of them have worked through that. And as they've, like you were saying, as they, they are now, you know, in their twenties and experiencing their own mental health struggles as most 20 somethings are. Mm -hmm. And I think it's helping them to have more empathy for what their mother was going through as, as a mother of five and, the pressures that she was facing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I know it's not always the case, but I think often this kind of is preceded by some other trauma or perhaps um, some type of mental disorder or illness. And there are many dynamics at play that kind of lead into this. And I was wondering if you could speak to what can you as a loved one do that that has a person like this in your life that you're constantly kind of in fear that this is something that they may do or attempt and um you know it can also become emotionally and psychologically exhausting for for you kind of as that support network because you're always you know trying to prevent something or thinking you could have done more or you should do more and it becomes difficult with your own boundaries so can you maybe give us or our audience, um, some pointers on, on what they can do in that situation. Yeah. Well, I would say always take every intimation side comment or serious, like take it seriously, even if they are joking or, you know, it's just, that's the first thing is creating, um, that communication. Um, I had one of my children, in their senior year, just really, you know, he had a plan. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had taken him to a therapist. The therapist put us in a meeting and had my son write that if he felt a certain way, like in writing, if I feel like I want or whatever, I will call my mom. 
mm-hmm. and I will call this person and I will call them, the three people. And he signed it and he stuck to it. And he's 22 years old and thriving and just got a scholarship and oh, every, oh, I won't say wonderful. his life is perfect, but you know, that mm-hmm. we got through that because of the communication issue. So I would say some people are so unassuming that they don't want to burden is the word is the actual word that many mm-hmm. of them use um, when they are feeling weighed down and heavy they don't want to bring that burden to someone else. Mm -hmm. And so they'd Mm -hmm. rather just suffer in silence or private or, you know, isolate that way if that's their depression. Um, And that was definitely my sister. Um, So I, because of this learning curve, because she was, she was suicidal on and off for several years before her final, you know, overdose in a hotel room. She did leave a letter behind um, stating that she felt like she could be a better guardian angel for her children than a mother because she only could see that she would end up in a state institution like that. Mm. She felt completely hopeless. She didn't Mm. want and she told her husband to get remarried and the whole thing. But um, looking back, there were times that she was crying out and somebody would get an intuitive hit if she wasn't crying out. Like mm-hmm. there were just different things that were, that we would, somebody that close to her would know things were not okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But she knew that. And so that's why she, she left and um, went to a hotel room because she just, she couldn't um, burden anyone mm-hmm. around her. Mm-hmm. And she said as much in her letter. So I would say the first thing is to just, if you are, and I have, I have coached mothers who have a suicidal child and, um, the burden that that does place on a close caregiver is mm-hmm. really immense. Mm-hmm. And so if you are that person, if you are the go-to person for someone in crisis, you need your own person. Yes. You, mm-hmm. you need your own crisis line. Mm-hmm. You need a, a, a competent professional person in your corner who's not going to give you the wrong advice. I think you're such a beacon of hope in this um, really difficult conversation. So I would love to ask you what would be like your number one message of hope to um, any of our audience members listening that may be suicide survivors? Uh, What would be your message of hope to them? Uh, Well, I have a dual message. One is more spiritual, I think, and one is more practical. The spiritual is that um, it's it's easier to work through, even though it feels hopeless and it feels hard. It's easier to stay in your body and work through this, hard as it may be, than to exit and try to work it out without a body. And Mm -hmm. and I mean that on multiple levels, like this body is a vessel of learning. It's, um, it's, there's a lot of polarity on the earth. This is the Jungian stuff, but, but ultimately the, the wake of people left behind, um, there's that, but there's also just your own soul of, uh, you know, this, this vessel of your body that allows you to do such deep learning and that suffering is profound Mm -hmm. and it, it will pass. It always does. Um, Mm -hmm. From a practical standpoint, you know, the world is incomplete without you. Like Mm -hmm. you're part of creation. And if there Mm -hmm. wasn't a you, it would be an incomplete creation. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, nobody wants their legacy to be that. My sister certainly did not want her legacy to be that of a suicidality in, uh, you know, she had immense gifts, um, music, the arts, all kinds of things. And so the world needs your light. The world needs your gifts. Um, We are advancing in research and technology to get um, more and more help for mental health. And, Mm -hmm. And you might be suffering because you're part of that solution and you have to feel it in your body and you have to experience it in order to be a way shower for others who are going to go through it. So mm-hmm. I would say it's probably part of your path mm-hmm. because you're here to be a guide 
and a light to others who will go through it. And they will, they will not listen to somebody who has not gone through it. They want mm-hmm. people who have gone through hell um, and come out the other side. So that's probably you if you're in the middle of it. And yeah. your ancestors are cheering you on. Mm-hmm. You know, we know a lot of these things, they didn't start with us. <clears throat> yeah. And um, so hold on. Yeah. Oh, so that's fun. beautiful. Thank you so much. For, thank you for that heartfelt message. I'm certainly going to take it with me and recall it whenever I can. If our audience would like to find you or know more about you, where can they go and, and where can they reach you? Yeah, well, <clears throat> thank you. Sorry, my voice is a little. <laughs> so you can just find me on um, my website is shereeburton.com, C-H-E-R-I-E. B-U-R-T-O-N. And um, we do also have a podcast called The Soul Rose Show. Mm-hmm. That's kind of a play on words. So I talk a lot about this Jungian stuff and spiritual psychology, but Soul Rose, the rose is feminine and it's like she rose. And um, it's beautiful. It's, it's just a play on the word rise. But yeah, I'll talk a lot about feminine spirituality and um, the sacred feminine Uh, sovereignty and empowerment and a lot of stuff on mental health as well so thank you so much thank you for your time thank you for sharing this really raw conversation with us we're so appreciative and i know that there are definitely listeners out there that would find hope and and new light in in a challenging situation thank you so much yes thank you so much